Um, so, uh, you know, we've been working our way through the Sermon on the Mount, but rather than, than dive back in, um, which I'll do week after next, we'll, we'll get back into it, I'm going to take us on another le- little detour this week. Um, and I want to look at something that really struck me as, we were, as we've been reading through um, Jesus' sermon. Um, so I want to just start by having a look at the verse that, that kind of got me thinking. I know we've seen this verse recently, I, I, but let's just bring it up so we can have a look at it. Um, there it is. Um, and then we'll start talking about it. So the verse is Matthew 5, 27, 28. You've heard it said, um, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with, in, with her in his heart. So this one, this one struck me for a couple of reasons. There's a couple of things there. So I want to go through it. So as I said um, a couple of times lately, so the, the Sermon on the Mount, um, the, the tone overall um, is somewhat rhetorical exaggeration, which means we're not necessarily meant to take all of it 100% literally. But whether you take it fully literally or not, the point is we're absolutely meant to take it seriously. And so what Jesus is saying here is that what happens internally what happens inside our hearts and our brains really matters and i thought well that's strange isn't it i mean how does it matter how does it affect anyone if i have in this case lustful thoughts i mean hang on okay you got it right (laughs) I'm just having some lustful thoughts right now about some people here. <laughs> How's it going? Are you okay with that? Are you, uh, is anyone feeling violated? I didn't really, but um, I might have, right? The point is, right, no, you're not affected at all. It doesn't matter what happens in my brain. So, so why, why is Jesus so concerned with it? Why does he care? Because, I mean, it doesn't seem to affect anyone. But Jesus says it matters. So if Jesus says it matters, it matters. It must do. Because I know Jesus always tells the truth. It must be true. Because if no one's affected by my thoughts, it just doesn't make sense. So there must be someone that's affected by my thoughts. Right? There must be. In fact, there is someone that's really affected by my thoughts. It's me. I'm really affected by my thoughts. That's interesting. Jesus must really care about me. He must be talking about this stuff for me, for my own good. Didn't think about that. But now I'm starting to get there. I'm saying, okay, so that's really interesting. Why does it matter? Why, does it, why is it going to affect me? How does it affect me? Well, let's go back to the Bible again and see if we can work it out. So I want to have a look at um, 2 Corinthians. This is... Um, Paul is explaining how he's been doing it tough. Um, Him and his mates have have been through a difficult time. But he says this. He says, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, that's pretty tough, inwardly we're actually being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. That's interesting. So, I feel like a couple of things going on here. So, first I see that my ego rallies against this. My ego says... Oh, I think I want to commit adultery. I'd like to commit adultery, even if it's just in my mind. I'm not hurting anyone. It's fun. I like it. Um, and it's, and what's, what's the point of, of telling me off about it? Because, you know, I'm an adult. and so. But actually, you know what? I kind of get to thinking, this is not really about adultery, is it? Well, I mean, it's in, it, it, adultery is included, but this is about our thoughts in general. It's about our thought patterns. It's about what we're thinking, what's okay to think, what's not okay to think. But so we could be talking about 
maybe just wishing bad things happening to other people, right? Or, um, or just, just some evil thing that we want to happen or about stealing or something. Just, just thinking about it. It's the same principle that we've got to be applying here. It's not, I don't think this is about adultery. Adultery is the example. But I think the principle is about having these bad thoughts and the effect that they're having. So my ego says it's okay. You can indulge in these things because it's only inside your brain. You don't have to control yourself. Just have fun. Enjoy. And besides which, it's my mind. It's no one else's mind. But when I start to think about it, I think, um, actually, there is a price to pay when I have these thoughts, even if they're just thoughts. At some level, I get that there, there is an effect. Because these lustful or malicious thoughts or whatever they are, they always end up at some time costing me. They, they cost me my peace. They cost me to feel regret. They cost me to feel like uh, there's something wrong with me for having these thoughts. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, we see Paul. <laughs> it kind of gives a bit of perspective on what's going on, and it's like, me with my ego and my lustful thoughts, and Paul. And what happens with Paul? He's gone through hard times, him and his mates, and he's, and he's suffering. He's really suffering for Jesus. And yet, not only does he not complain, he says he's actually being renewed by the suffering. It seems like he's kind of weighed up the cost of the suffering and, and what it means for him in the short term versus the eternal rewards that he knows is going to come through the suffering. And, and he's saying, well, there's no contest here. He's saying, give me the short-term pain for the long-term gain any time. So I say there's kind of a double whammy thing going on here. The consequences of um, nasty thoughts, uh, like adultery or evil thoughts or whatever they are, um, is the short-term guilt and remorse and so on, um, and the separation that it causes. It causes me to be separate from the person that I'm thinking about, from my partner, perhaps. Certainly there's a separation from God when we're having these thoughts. And it also keeps us for potential eternal rewards. It's a really heavy price that we pay when we indulge ourselves in these thoughts. But Jesus so clearly said, don't do it. Because the effect is the same. The effect of thinking them is the same as if you'd done them. The effects are separation and all the internal remorse. And whether you've actually done it, or whether you've just thought it, the effect on you is the same. And it's a heavy price. So, as I've read through these verses a, a few times, I come to really focus on the last line. So I'm going to have a look at that. It says, so we fix our eyes, it's Jesus, not on what is seen, but what is unseen, oh, sorry, this is Paul, was it? Um, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So a couple of thoughts came to mind about this. So the first thing I realised is that my thoughts are definitely unseen, yeah? And if the unseen is eternal, that means my thoughts are eternal. And that is really scary, <laughs> Because if adulterous thoughts and evil thoughts are eternal, then um, I'm in an eternal load of trouble. But thank God for Jesus, yeah? Because Jesus paid the price for my thoughts even. Because the eternal consequences of my evil thoughts have been covered over by Jesus, by his blood. Not the temporary consequences in this life. But the eternal consequences of our thoughts have been covered by Jesus' blood when we have faith in him. But something else occurred to me. If what is unseen is eternal, there must be a lot of power in that. There must be a lot of power in the eternal. So I want to know more about this unseen story. Tell me about the unseen. I thought, I began to look into that. What I discovered is that the way that we view the eternal has a very big effect on its power over us or, or perhaps on the power that we 
that we can get from it. And that power is, is here and now, in the temporary, not an eternal way off kind of thing. Our view, the way we see eternity, the way we see death, the afterlife, all that, has a huge effect. How we're looking at the eternal has a huge effect on us. It's about where we come to it. And I think there are three basic general ways of, of seeing it or of reacting to it, the eternal. I think the most common way, certainly in this, this part of the world, um, is to say, well, actually, the eternal probably doesn't even exist. And if it does exist, I'm probably going to be okay. Um, and if I'm not okay, well, there's nothing much I can do about it. Now, if you ask these people, and you can because they're kind of everywhere, about, well, why do you think that? Why, why do you think that there is or there isn't? And, and it, why do you think you're going to be okay, probably? But they won't really answer. They don't really want to think about it. People around here, anyway, it's like, oh, well, I just do, and let's leave it there, and I don't even want to talk about it. I certainly don't want to think about it. And so what people are left with is, is nothing more than just this world. And as we know, only too well, this world is tough. And you see happy, brave faces, but the fact is that most people are walking around with a level of stress and anxiety and depression and despair. And most people have a terrible fear of death. And they fear death not because it's eternal, or rather not because of the eternal consequences that might happen. They actually fear death because they just think that's the end of their existence and they don't want to finish. I want to show you something. This is a sign that I saw on the side of a pub in St Kilda. It says, some days you wake up and immediately start to worry. Nothing in particular is wrong. It's just the suspicion that forces are, are um, aligning quietly and there will be trouble. And I looked at that and I thought, seriously? Like, that's going to get people to come to your pub because of that. Right? So in other words, it's awful. You may as well get drunk. I don't know what they are thinking, but... I'm looking at that and going, gosh, doesn't that speak to what I'm talking about this week? I mean, it's just the hopelessness of society that that is an ad. I mean, that, I took that photo this week on the side of a pub. It's not made up. I don't get it. But I think it kind of it illustrates my point. That's where the world is at. Now, the second view, um, less common, is that, yes, there's an afterlife. They kind of believe in it. And they get, it's either going to be awful or it's going to be wonderful. But I've done so many terrible things, I'm bound to end up in the awful place. And there's nothing I can do about that. That's an awful category. These people have all the stresses from that first category, plus they have this extra stress of, the, of e e eternal punishment that they're expecting. And they, of course, have a, an incredibly even more so fear of death. But there's a third category. These people are also fully aware that there is an, an eternal world, that there is an afterlife, but their view of death is that it's actually a wonderful, exciting transition um, from the temporary into the eternal. But unlike, oh, and, um, and like the second group, they believe that it's either going to be awful or it's going to be wonderful, but unlike that second group, they believe it's going to be wonderful. And they expect they will end up in the wonderful place. Because this group knows that no matter what it is that they've done in this world, there is a way for all their sins to be forgiven. They know that their sins have actually been removed from them as far as east is from the west, through their faith in Jesus Christ. We know this group well, don't we? They know that Jesus died for them so that they could have a restored relationship with the Father. And that that is a relationship of love, of eternal love with God. And this, this knowledge brings peace, immense peace, calm and joy into this temporary crazy world that we live in. Well, at least it should do, shouldn't it? I mean, it should. That's amazing. What well, this, this short, just this thought, if I'm with Jesus, if I believe with Jesus, if I make Jesus my Lord... I will have an eternity with him. That should be enough that no matter what it gets thrown at me in this life, I'm going to be, it's all okay, and I'm going to just carry the joy and peace, and I'm going to be good. But, strangely enough, this third group often seems to live just like that first group. 
they, they know that they're safe and it's going to be awesome afterwards. But they don't let that fact bring the peace and the joy and the calmness that it should do into their, basic, into their daily lives. Basically, they just forget. And when I say they, I mean we forget, don't we? I mean I. Mean I. I mean, I forget. Like, um, you know, I get caught up in, in am I going to be able to pay the bills and, and in, in all the stresses of the relationships you know, in my family and in the church and everywhere else, you know, and in, and in cricket matches that we lose. <laughs> There's been a few of those lately, let me tell you. So it's easy to do, isn't it? It's, it's easy to, to forget about this stuff. So what do we do about that? How do we help ourselves to... To remember, how do we take hold of this joy, this calmness, and this, this peace that we should just be living in all the time? Well, let's have a look in the Bible. I found two keys. This comes from Paul. Um, his, this advice is, was originally given uh, to the church in Corinth. This comes from 2 Corinthians 10, 4 to 5. It says, The weapons we fight with and not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Them fighting words, them, isn't they? It's strong language. Weapons and demolishing strongholds and divine power. And the thing is, this battle, you don't actually have to be as big and strong as, like me, right? <laughs> you, could, you could be as old and frail as um, the Queen. <laughs> to be a warrior in this particular battle, um, and, and to win this war, there are... Two kinds of combat that you need to master. The first is right there. It's demolishing arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. In other words, we actually need to know the truth. We need to know the truth. We, know, we need to know the difference between right and wrong. And when I say between right and wrong, I don't mean good and bad kind of right and wrong. I mean correct and incorrect kind of right and wrong. And guess what? We've got one very, very trustworthy source that we can access super easily to master this. The Bible, isn't it? That truth is right there, and it's been given to us. And this is just yet one more reason why I keep telling you it's so important that we know our Bibles. If we want to be good warriors in this thought world, in this uh, eternal combat world, need to know the truth. We need to master the truth. And there's a second kind of combat that we see in this verse. We need to take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. See, the thing is, crazy ideas come into our minds. We guess. We doubt. We, we listen to crazy preachers. <laughs> I did point at myself then, but um, we listen to crazy prophets who tell us crazy things that aren't actually in line with the Bible. And that's just the Christians. <laughs> we listen to our heathen friends that tell us all kinds of crazy things. We watch the TV or the internet with shows that are not in line with the Bible, the things that we're seeing there. We freely, we willingly fill ourselves up with rubbish. And of course, when you fill yourself up with rubbish, the rubbish is going to end up in your thoughts, isn't it? Paul says... When we do this, we're in danger of handing back one of our greatest weapons, the truth. Our number one weapon is the truth. And we need to make sure that we take control of that. And to do that, we need to keep captive every thought that's not true. So part of that is not exposing ourselves as much as possible to wrong thoughts. And part of that is knowing what the truth is. So that when a wrong thought comes up, we can confidently say, no, 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 that's not true. I know that. Lock that one up, throw it away. So that's the first key. The key to what? The key to hanging on to the peace and the calmness and the joy that we have been promised. 
We need to know our Bible so we know what the truth is. And we need to take captive any thought that comes up that isn't in line with that truth. But as I promised, there's a second key. Um, this comes from Paul's letter to the church in Philippi. This is Philippians 4, 6 to 7. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, we're looking for that peace, weren't we, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds, so our minds, we're dealing with that, in Christ. So this passage fits pretty nicely with what we've been looking at before. Again, we see peace available through God. But look closely at this. It's quite amazing. That peace itself guards our hearts and minds through Jesus. So how do we access that peace? I think I was too far away from the microphone. Prayer. <laughs> It's not hard, right? It's not hard to access that peace. How do we access the power of the unseen? I'll just dance for a second. <laughs> Somebody want to dance with me? <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> how do we access the power of the unseen? How, how do we access the power of the eternal? Right. Yeah? It's kind of obvious, isn't it? And what kind of situation calls for prayer? Every situation. There's nothing too big to pray about. There's nothing too small to pray about. Pray, 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 pray. Take it to God. I think you might have heard me say that before. Notice there's one instruction about how we go about this prayer. Paul says pray with thanksgiving. Give thanks before you've received. I've said this before. No doubt I'll say it again. God is really interested in our faith. When we give thanks before we receive, we're really demonstrating that faith. We're really putting that faith into action and we're growing that faith. Now, there's one last thing I want you to notice about this. And this thing is really blew my mind. It doesn't say, pray with thanksgiving and you're going to get everything that you've asked for. The Bible never, ever, ever makes that promise. It says... Pray with thanksgiving and you will receive peace transcends understanding. To getting stuff doesn't necessarily bring peace. And in fact, even having all our prayers answered doesn't necessarily bring peace. Praying brings peace. It's in the prayer that the peace comes. So think of it this way. What would you prefer? Lots of stuff or peace in your hearts and minds? Now, stuff is okay. Nothing wrong with stuff. It's okay to pray for stuff. You know, God wants you to have some stuff. It's useful to have some stuff. That's okay. But I know for me, if I had to choose between having some stuff and having peace, I'd take peace any day of the week. And that is actually the offer that's being made through prayer. prayer. And that is incredibly powerful. Today, we've been looking at our private worlds, actually, at our hidden worlds, our secret worlds, the invisible worlds, the worlds of our thoughts and our brains. And we've discovered that this world is actually super important to God. These worlds might actually be hidden to everyone else, but God lives there. He's fully aware of everything that happens inside our brains. And we know that God loves us, and we know that he wants the best for us. So the reason that God is so concerned with our inner thoughts is that they're very powerful. And the first person that's most affected by this is actually us. Negative thoughts are really harmful. They really have a harmful effect on, on us. And so God wants us to control these negative thoughts by controlling the things that we allow into our brains and knowing what the truth is so that we can kill dead any of these negative harmful thoughts as soon as they arise. Now, on the positive side, when our thirds, thoughts turn to God, to his eternal promises, the promise to be by his side in an eternal loving relationship, and when they turn to God in prayer, and especially when it aligns with his will, we actually access God's power to change the world. That is 
Very powerful indeed. So let's pray over that. Thank you, Lord, for caring so much about us that you even care about our thoughts. Thank you that you've given us instructions on how to make the most of this life. And more importantly, that you have made a way for us to spend eternity with you. Thank you, Lord, for the peace that this understanding brings. Help us, Lord, to bring this good news to the lost and hurting generation that surrounds us. And help us to control our thoughts, to take captive anything that is negative or harmful, and to focus on the truth that you have revealed to us, the good news that we find in the Bible. You are an awesome God, and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.